Welcome to the inaugural episode of the Kingdom Hearts 4 World Watch. Is that a good title? I didn't know what to call this. Oh man, we're off to a bad start. Well, as the introduction may have implied, this is the first in what I hope to make a series of video discussions about what properties fans of the Kingdom Hearts series both want and expect to see in Kingdom Hearts 4. For the sake of keeping this from being one gigantic project, I'm planning on splitting this up into a couple of different categories. As you can see, this episode is focused on the theatrical animated Disney canon. For the unacquainted, this refers to the, as of now, 60 films produced by Walt Disney Animation Studios from Snow White up to Encanto. So no Pixar, no live action, no direct-to-DVD sequels, there will be episodes on those at later dates. Speaking of which, I'll need your help for those future installments. For this first part, I collected data from about 1,200 respondents through a Google Forms survey. The survey was split into two parts, as they'll all be. Part 1 asked the participant to rank each movie from 1 to 10 by how much they want to see it be given the full world treatment in Kingdom Hearts 4, 1 being no interest and 10 being a must-have. Part 2 showed the same films in the same order, but asked participants to rank them by how likely they think it is that they'll make an appearance as a world. 1 denoting no chance, and 10 denoting nearly 100% confidence. So while the survey for this video is closed, the one for the next part, focused on the Pixar canon, is still open. I've already collected a good amount of responses from Twitter and Discord, but I'd like to get some more, so the survey will be in the description and pinned comment. The idea here is to gauge how fans are feeling about different properties, as well as provide my own thoughts on how much I'd like to see a world and how likely I think it is that we'll see it. While we have a bunch of spreadsheets and data and math involved here, this is really just for fun. I'm not proposing that anything we look at here or anything I opine is what's going to happen. If anything, it'll be fun to look back at once the game's out to see how right or wrong we were, or at least provide a space for discussion on what we want or think we'll see in KH4. So, the plan is to look at the audience's want ranking and probability ranking from the survey, I'll give my own, and we'll talk about each property. I think before getting into the rankings proper though, I should give something of a preface about my general thoughts on the direction this series may or may not be taking when it comes to its worlds. First off, as per the most recent Nomura interview with Game Informer, we know that there will be Disney worlds in this game, as I have always anticipated. I do get the impression from his answer that we'll have the same amount or possibly fewer worlds than KH3. When asked about how much Disney presence there would be in KH4, Nomura made it clear that it would be much like the previous games, but then tacked on this sort of tangent about graphical qualities, noting that the increased specs actually sort of limit how many worlds they can include. This makes me lean towards more live-action stuff in the same vein as Pirates being featured more in this title. Not saying entirely live-action stuff, but maybe more than one this go-around. And or in conjunction with the fact that every new Disney property introduced in KH3 was a CGI movie, I also lean towards the idea that we might not be seeing any more traditionally animated films, aka anything released between 1937 and 2009. There's no real hard evidence on that, it's just my gut feeling. If this were a sort of stepping stone game, like A Birth by Sleep or Dream Drop, I think the likelihood would be higher to see more classic style movies turned into worlds. Part of me would think that Disney would be most interested in showing off properties that are most visually similar to what they're currently putting out, but that also sort of goes against the proven fact that Nomura does have a lot of control over what gets put in. I doubt the Disney folks were really pushing for Tron representation back in 2005. By that same token, some people think Disney forced Frozen onto Nomura for KH3, but don't get it twisted, Nomura fucking loves Frozen. He's always going to push for what he really wants, so at the end of the day, if he wants a bunch of 2D stuff, that's what we'll get. But if we're just going off the last major entry, we only got Olympus and 100 Acre Wood representing that era of Disney animation, and my gut says that's the sign of a shift, but who knows. I'll be equally happy to be right or wrong on this. That all being said, you should expect my prediction rankings for a lot of these films in this episode to be relatively low. A lot of these films start at like a 2 or 3 and then nudge slightly lower or higher depending on how interesting or workable I think it would be for a world. We should also bear in mind that these teams can make a world out of anything. If we've seen them give us worlds based on less action or adventure heavy movies like Cinderella, worlds based on movies without a narrative through line like Fantasia, or worlds based on a black and white short from the 20s like Steamboat Willie, truly anything is possible if you ask me. Okay, I think that's all the groundwork that I wanted to lay, so let's get into our first movie in the animated lineup that is, as of yet, unrepresented with a world in the Kingdom Hearts series. Dumbo, released back in 1941, this is the fourth oldest film in the traditional canon, and the oldest one without a world, with its three predecessors Snow White, Pinocchio, and Fantasia already having been represented. Dumbo the character has appeared in the series in the past as a summon in both Cage 1 and Chain of Memories, as well as a medal in Union Cross. And I tend to think that's probably the extent of what we'll see from the big-eared flying elephant. 
I'd give Dumbo a ranking of 2 for both want and prediction ratings. It gets a little bit of a boost for being a true classic, but I get the impression that the series is satisfied with how it's represented the film thus far. I also don't have a ton of desire to see it in action, but I'm sure they could do it justice. It'd have to be primarily a circus environment, which I do think would be fun, but maybe a bit redundant after having something like Prankster's Paradise. It could also go the route of shrinking the party down a la Toy Box or Ven's Castle of Dreams, maybe teaming up with Timothy the Mouse instead of Dumbo himself. The audience was a bit more interested in the idea, but only slightly, with an average want ranking of 3.38, but still ranked 27th out of the 34 films in the survey. The audience's prediction score was a bit closer to mine, averaging at 2.57, but 18th out of 34. Here we have the chronologically next film in the canon, 1942's Bambi, which has also been represented to almost the same extent as Dumbo through a KH1 and Com Summon. My thoughts on Bambi are largely the same as on Dumbo. It's got a little bit of juice behind it due to being a classic and having a foot or hoof in the door, but I don't see the series being super interested in doing anything more with it. I know I said anything could work for a world, but I struggle to find something super interesting based on Bambi without taking a lot of creative liberties. A whole lot of woods and meadows, I guess? There's also the weirdness of having to set the world either pre- or post-time jump, and while the more action-y parts of the movie are in the second half, the first half is by far more iconic and probably what you first think of when you hear the name Bambi. So another two for prediction, and to be honest, a one for want. I'm not a big Bambi guy, as I've said before. I'm not a big Bambi guy. I'm not a big Bambi guy. So I don't really need this. The audience felt pretty similarly, giving Bambi a want score of 3.29, just slightly lower than Dumbo, and a prediction score of 2.43, or 22 out of 34. And now we get into some comparatively weirder ones, which I think I'll just lump together because my thoughts on them are all pretty similar. Here we have a slew of wartime and post-wartime package films, starting with 1942's Saludos Amigos and ending with 1949's The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. For the unfamiliar, when I say package films, I mean movies that don't consist of one singular plotline, but instead anywhere from two to ten shorter segments stitched together and presented as one movie. Some of these films and their segments are definitely more workable than others, but if anything involving this batch of movies comes to pass as far as a KH world goes, I would expect the world itself to be something of a package world, wholly based on all all of these 40s flicks. Sort of like how Timeless River wasn't just a Steamboat Willie world, but a world that took inspiration and references from all of those cartoon shorts of that era. Many of these films also infuse live-action footage of non-actors in real-life places, so in a way, you could consider these films being represented via a world to be more likely now than ever, given the quadratum of it all, but I would still consider it to be unlikely. Films like Saludos Amigos or 1945's The Three Caballeros, which effectively served as goodwill messages toward Latin America during wartime, are probably not at the top of either Disney or Nomura's list for their action RPG game releasing in the 2020s, but who knows. I'm not going to complain if we get to hang out with Jose or Panchito, but I don't really see it. A 1 for prediction for both of these, but a 2 for 1 just for the curiosity of how they'd do it. The audience is also not confident in their chances with a prediction ranking of 1.36 for Saludos and a 1.61 for Caballeros. As for their want score, Saludos received a 2.94, with Caballeros getting a surprisingly high 3.7. I guess people just really like that trio of birds. While those two films definitely had musical elements to them, another pair of package films, 1946's Make My Music and 48's Melody Time, definitely leaned further into the musical side of things. Not too unlike what Fantasia did, but a bit less grand, and considering we had Symphony of Sorcery cover this ground already, I don't really want or need to see these, so it's a one for me for both films and both scores. The audience feels pretty much the same, with both films at the bottom of both scoreboards. A 2.14 for Melody Time's Want Score, and a 2.12 for Make My Music, settling at 33rd and 34th out of 34 movies, respectively. Prediction-wise, they land in the same spots, a 1.27 for Melody Time, and a 1.23 for Make My Music. The most interesting of the package films, at least to me, are 1947's Fun and Fancy Free and 49's The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad. Coincidentally, or maybe not, these also have the fewest separate segments of this 40s batch, with two each, plus a weird puppet segment in Fancy Free. Jeff Dunham is shaking and screaming. I could be biased because I watched Fun and Fancy Free a decent amount as a kid, but the more iconic of its two segments, Mickey and the Beanstalk, is, in my eyes, an easier fit for a KH world than anything we've talked about so far, and even some properties that have already been given worlds. You would probably have to take the same route as The Country of the Musketeers, with potentially alternate versions of MDG, which I wouldn't love, but I could easily see Sora running around in the giant's house and sliding down the beanstalk. So I'd actually give this one a 2 for prediction, but a 4 for the want score. I think it could be neat, if still highly unlikely. 
The audience was less receptive for both scores, giving it a 2.39 for its want score, 31st out of 34, and a prediction score of 1.35, 32nd out of 34. For me, based on the Mickey segment alone, it's gotta be the most likely out of all these 40s package movies, but the people have spoken, and they don't think it's worth the hill of magic beans. But it's fine, we're splitting hairs anyway. The next most suitable of these package films, IMO, is Ichabod and Mr. Toad, which is another double segment movie with one half based on The Wind in the Willows and the other half on The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, with the latter being my preferred segment of the two. Give me some sort of Headless Horseman boss segment. I don't know, it scared the shit out of me as a kid, so let's just reimagine it. But I'd still probably give it a 1 for prediction and 2 for want, not really a priority for me. The audience actually wants this film represented the most out of everything we've covered so far, a 3.82, which is 23rd out of 34. As for prediction, it received a 1.72, 27th out of 34. Getting back to the more traditional stuff and skipping the already used Cinderella, Alice in Wonderland, and Peter Pan, we land on 1955's Lady and the Tramp, which we've only had represented through a third district fountain in Travers Town. I don't feel particularly strongly about Lady and the Tramp, and there's a good handful of movies about canines or felines in the canon, and only The Lion King has been given the full cage treatment so far. I recall talking about this in my KH1 1992 video, but I have to wonder if the team isn't super interested in doing more of these quadruped movies, having already done Pride Lands and repeatedly dropping the Jungle Book during development, which we'll get to. You'd think they'd have to make another four-legged form change for Sora and possibly company, and maybe they've already gotten their fill on that. Even so, I would also have to think that one of these types of movies being included would mean that the others would sit on the sidelines, and of these types of movies, Lady and the Tramp is on the lower end for me as much as I would love to fight a flying spaghetti monster heartless. There's nothing about the environment that says this movie absolutely couldn't work, but without ties to something like the Princesses of Heart and the BBS worlds, this feels like a sort of sleepy and less exciting pick. Despite that, this movie dethrones Ichabod and Toad for both want and prediction scores for the audience so far. For want, a 4.28, 20th out of 34, and for prediction, a 2.84, 15th out of 34. Which might go to show the audience doesn't have a ton of faith in a lot of these films considering a movie more than halfway up the prediction scoreboard is still under a 3. Me, I'd probably give it a 2 for both prediction and want. Skipping over Sleeping Beauty and speaking of dog movies, we've got 1961's 101 Dalmatians. And if you recall, these guys were part of a major side quest in KH1, so they're not fully strangers to the series. I feel roughly the same about this movie as I do the last one, but I'm slightly more into the idea of this one. Even though the series has been to England or England adjacent a good handful of times. I mean, it's nothing compared to France. Plus, I've played 102 Dalmatians Puppies to the Rescue on PS1, so I know it's video gameable. Plus plus, they've already got Suzanne Blakesley on hand for voicing Cruella, and she'd probably overthrow Maleficent if she had the chance. Like, ruling all worlds isn't even that big of a deal as far as darkness goes when compared to, like, kidnapping and skinning puppies. Definitely a bigger sense of adventure to this one compared to most of our previous entries here, but I also get the impression that the series is satisfied with just leaving these guys as collectible cameos in the first game. That being said, just give me a big genre shift where I'm leading 99 puppies into a Pikmin-like battle against Heartless. At this point, it feels more likely than a Pikmin 4. I'll stick with another 2 for prediction, but a 3 for want. Once again, this is the new audience favorite for both scoreboards, a want score of 4.84, 15th place and the highest of all these quadruped-led movies, and a prediction score of 3.25, putting it at 13th overall. Next up is 1963's The Sword in the Stone, which has at least been represented by Merlin's inclusion in the numbered titles plus Birth by Sleep. Gotta say, this is one of those older Disney movies that I watched for the first time during early quarantine, and I found it really, really boring, so I'm not exactly aching to see it, though I do think it could have legs and stands a decent-ish chance when compared to a lot of what we've discussed. It feels like Merlin's had, oddly enough, an increased presence as the number titles go on, like for some reason he gave Mickey and Riku their Keyblades in KH3, like their new ones. Every time I remember that, I'm like, why? I do think the best spot for this movie was probably in something like a BBS. I get the impression that the Cage version of Merlin is one who's already gone through his movie's plot, so maybe Arthur's journey or, you know, episodic animal hijinks were best suited for something set in the not terribly distant past. Even KH1 could have been a decent enough time for it, with Arthur and Excalibur serving as a sort of echo to Sora and the Keyblade. I would envision this world as like a cross between Enchanted Dominion and the Fairy Tale Kingdom. But like I said, not something I'd be terribly excited for. I'll give it like a 2.5 for both prediction and want. The audience, however, is way higher on the want side, a 6.13 and making it the 10th most wanted movie from the survey. Its prediction score is also the highest so far, but still relatively low at a 3.95, also 10th overall. 
And now we arrive at what seems like the always the bridesmaid but never the bride of Cage Worlds with 1967's The Jungle Book. And I gotta say, I just think if it was really ever gonna happen, it would've happened by now. There's probably a good reason as to why it got scrapped and only exists in an incomplete state in BBS's code. And I don't know, I feel like I'm good as far as the jungle-based movies go in Kingdom Hearts, like we got Deep Jungle and Pride Lands, and frankly, I find those movies and settings more interesting than The Jungle Book. I'm not saying I would hate it, I think Baloo would be fun, I wanna beat the shit out of Ka, I'd love a wanna be like you field theme, but I just think the time for it has passed. The Jungle Book is the last film in what many people consider the Silver Age of Disney movies, starting with Cinderella, and the games just haven't really pulled from this era since Birth by Sleep with Cinderella and Sleeping Beauty, and those are properties that were previously referenced in KH1. I'll have more to say about these film eras in a bit, but I just get the feeling that they're pretty much satisfied with how this block of time has been represented, considering nothing has been pulled from it since 2010, and a lot of the heavier hitters from this era, like Peter Pan, have already been used. I think this one just missed its window. I may have been a bit negative on The Jungle Book, but I still wouldn't mind it. I'll give it a 1 to 4 and a prediction of 3.5. They listen to the fans sometimes for sure, and the fans really seem to want Jungle Book, even if I don't fully share their enthusiasm. As evidenced by its want score, a 6.44, one spot above the Sword in the Stone, and ninth overall. The prediction score is more modest, but still relatively high for this exercise so far, at 4.78, but 7th overall. Moving along to another quadruped flick, we have 1970's The Aristocats. This is one of those movies that I really liked as a kid, and having watched it as an adult, I'm not sure why. I think I just really liked the part where they play in the paint at the beginning, and the Everybody Wants to Be a Cat song. I know this movie has its fans, but I feel like Disney isn't really running around showing this one off a ton. And if the games were ever going to turn Sora into a cat, it was always going to be for its take on The Lion King, and I don't really anticipate that we'll be downgrading to be less grand and more domestic for another feline outing. To circle back to the talk of these film eras, The Aristocats is the start of the so-called The Bronze Era of Disney animation, and this era's bronzeness is reflected in its representation in Kingdom Hearts. Everything in the Golden Era, 1937-42, to has already been represented. Five movies spread out across three worlds and two summons. In the aforementioned Silver Era, four out of eight movies have shown up as worlds, but in the Bronze Era we've seen nothing except Winnie the Pooh show up, and by the time KH1 released in 2002, that franchise had long grown beyond its first movie in 1977. This is all to say, it seems like either Disney, Nomura, or both aren't super invested in the 70s and 80s era, and I have less and less reason to believe they'd start now as the series chugs along. So it's a 1 for prediction and a 2 for want if only for misguided nostalgic purposes. Breaking the trend of the newest movie beating out the older ones, the audience was more middling on the Aristocats with a want score of 4.59, 17th overall, and a prediction score of 2.46, 20th overall. Next up is 1973's Robin Hood, which I do think is the most iconic film of this era, minus the many adventures of Winnie the Pooh. I feel like a bit of a curmudgeon, but this one also never really grabbed me either, but I did grow up with the bigger and more adventurous Renaissance era films, so I'm probably just biased. Then again, if a Robin Hood world means getting to see Sora be explicitly anti-capitalist, I'll give it a want score of 12. I did envision a Sherwood Forest world in that KH 1992 video as a sort of Coliseum substitute, but given KH 3, I don't know how invested they are in something like that for the future. I could see the environment and the plot of this world working out entirely fine, but I again think it's also something that just missed its window despite how relatively recognizable it is. I've also been told it sort of inspired a generation of, you know, animal appreciation, so maybe that's partly why it's got an audience want score of 6.46, 8th overall, and the most wanted movie thus far. On the prediction side, it's actually a bit lower than Sword in the Stone and Jungle Book with a score of 3.63 and 12th most likely. I guess I'll give it an actual want score of 3 and a prediction score of 3.5. If they ever pull from this era for a world, it'll be Robin Hood, which might not inspire a ton of hope for the upcoming handful. And kicking off that handful is 1977's The Rescuers, which for the purposes of this survey I just lumped in with its sequel, 1990's The Rescuers Down Under. If you ignore the weirder movies like Fantasia 2000 and Winnie the Pooh 2011, which I don't really consider to be true sequels, The Rescuers was the only film in the animated canon to get a sequel also in the canon until Wreck-It Ralph, so that's why you're seeing it referenced here. I also don't anticipate they'd pull from the sequel before the original, but I also also don't anticipate they'll pull from either at all. There's, in my eyes, a superior rodent-based adventure flick coming up that I think not only works better but is more beloved, and I'd have to think it would also hold preference if it came down to getting a KH world. 
This is another case of if one gets in, the other doesn't, and I think the Rescuers is on the losing side of that exchange. I will say though, I thought the original Rescuers was okay, and the sequel was entertaining enough watching both during that quarantine binge. A shrunken down Sora joining up with Bernard and Bianca as part of the Rescue Aid Society would no doubt be charming. But this is also a movie, or I guess duology, that I never came across or even heard of as a kid, and also not something Disney seems to promote a ton. I'll give it like a 1.5 for prediction and a 2.5 for want. As for the audience, they gave these films a want score of 4.68, 16th overall, and a prediction score of 2.42, which is 23rd overall. Next up, we've entered the 80s, a nearly entirely unharvested decade save for The Little Mermaid in 89. Here we've got 81's The Fox and the Hound, which to me is sort of like the millennials' Bambi. A movie about cute animals with a tragic twinge that's a lot more fun and memorable in the first half, at least if you ask me. And also like Bambi, I don't think it would make a super entertaining Kingdom Hearts world. The story is pretty cozy and personal, and I don't know how you can really wedge Sora into that. Once again, I firmly believe they can find a way for any of these, but I tend to think they'd want to stick to things that either lend themselves more easily to action or have a good thematic reason for being included. A Fox and the Hound sort of plot was probably best suited as some kind of Sora and Riku parallel back in the Cage 1 era, but this film just never had that oomph or sense of adventure behind it for me to ever really consider it for a Cage world. I guess aside from a boss fight against that big bastard of a bear. So, I've never seen this as something with a huge shot, and if it ever did have a chance, I think those chances in 2022 are as dead as the Widow Tweed's husband. I seriously can't get over, like, a whole community of people referring to someone as the Widow Tweed. Like, unless she really hated or, like, triumphantly killed her husband, I don't know why everyone feels the need to remind her constantly. I have something of a soft spot for this movie, although I've admittedly not seen it in a while, so, uh... A 1 for prediction, but a 1.5 for want? Very generous, I know. The audience also didn't give this one a ton of fanfare. A want score of 3.72 for 24th place, and a prediction score of 2.05 for 25th place. Oh boy, we've arrived at 1985's The Black Cauldron, which is assuredly the bronzest of the bronze era, and that's the nicest way I can put it. Sorry to show my Cage 1992 video again, but I discussed this movie's place in Disney history a little bit in that project, and all of that definitely factors into how I view it for this project. AKA, the only feasible way I ever saw it getting into KH is if the series started out 10 years earlier and had fewer options to pick from. And even then, it might have been a stretch. Disney does not like this movie, it cost a lot of money and made none, critics hated it, and its few fans basically had to annoy the studio until they released it on VHS more than a decade after its original theatrical run. Unless Nomura has a secret soft spot for this movie, I think you can probably forget about this one. I will say it does at least have some interesting environments, although this intrigue is weighed down by a cast of characters that make saltine crackers seem overwhelming. I know this movie has a sort of cult classic air to it, but the air is from a dusty cauldron that I have never managed to inhale without coughing. And it's a shame too, because I've actually heard good things about the book series the movie is based on, The Chronicles of Perdane. Like many of these movies, would I be mad to see it in KH? Not really, unless it was explicitly stated to be included at the expense of something that I really wanted to see. And even still, I recommend not getting genuinely mad at video games, the world's got another, like, I don't know, five years left, so no need to cut those years short with high blood pressure. So yeah, another one for prediction, but you know what, fuck it, a 4.5 for one. I just think they could do a good job with it, and it can't get any worse than the movie for me. The audience is actually relatively high on The Black Cauldron 2, at 5.6, 12th overall, and I don't know if that's genuine cult classic love showing up, or meme votes because Gurgi is something of a running joke in my Twitch chat. Why not both? The audience isn't kidding itself for the prediction score though, with a 2.44 and 24th place overall. I feel like it really shouldn't be just barely beating Bambi, like I feel like Bambi is infinitely more likely, yet I only gave that movie a 2, so I don't know, maybe my grading scale is all wrong, but let's move on. To that aforementioned superior mouse adventure film, 1986's The Great Mouse Detective. I just find the environments and characters in this movie to be a lot more interesting than those in either Rescuers film, though that doesn't mean I find it incredibly more likely. I do think that even though Robin Hood is the most iconic of these Bronze Era films, The Great Mouse Detective feels like it'd be the most natural fit for a KH world when compared to those other options. And the movie is something of an unsung hero for Disney. The Renaissance in the 90s is usually credited for bringing Disney back to the forefront, and that's true, but after the commercial and critical failure that was The Black Cauldron, the studios definitely needed a win with their next project. Hard to say what the company would have done if this one also grossed like half of its budget. That being said though, the movie never really seems to get much recognition from the company, and again, unless it's been like this sleeper cell movie for Nomura this whole time, I don't personally see it making it into any KH game. 
which is a shame because I'd love to bludgeon Professor Radigan inside the inner mechanisms of Large Benjamin. I could also easily see Sora trying and failing to keep up with Basil's deductive skills and just sort of going along for the ride. A 1.5 for prediction, but a 6 for want. I actually just really appreciated this movie's vibe when I watched it for the first time in 2020. The audience was slightly less enthusiastic, putting TGMD's want score at 5.39, 14th place. They were a bit more bullish on it prediction-wise, with a 2.57 rating in 17th place. And for our last pre-Renaissance movie, we have 1988's Oliver and Company, which for the unfamiliar is Charles Dickens' Oliver Twist, but with pets and in New York City, I guess. The audience gives just about as much of a shit about this movie as I do, though I'm sure it has its fans. My friend Kiwi and I have discussed that this movie's best chance is probably through something like a world that's just straight up based on New York, just a clusterfuck of a shared world space between this, Soul, and the Avengers, you know, the classic iconic trio. That's mostly just a joke, since Disney seems pretty picky about how and what properties are allowed to interact, at least as far as KH goes, but it's still kind of a fun thought. While The Black Cauldron feels fairly visually and thematically dark by Disney standards, it's at least somewhat unique for that reason, but to me, Oliver and Company feels interchangeable with like any studio making cartoons or animated movies in 1988. It just lacks that Disney charm, but also isn't even that weird or egregiously bad to set it apart. I guess the Billy Joel song in the beginning is fun though. It's a 1 for both scores for me. The audience was a little more favorable, though this dog slash cat movie only beat out Fox and the Hound for the audience's least favorite a 3.99 want score for 22nd place. As for prediction, it fared worse with a 1.98, 26th overall. And now for the only film remaining in the Disney Renaissance to have no world or even representation in Kingdom Hearts besides that caveat case of the rescuers down under, it's 1995's Pocahontas. As I've referenced several times throughout the video, the 90s are one of, if not the most celebrated block of time as far as theatrical Disney goes, and this era's popularity is fully reflected in Kingdom Hearts. The first game threw in Tarzan, Hercules, Aladdin, and The Little Mermaid, and Cage 2 nearly finished the job by including Mulan, Beauty and the Beast, and The Lion King. And finally, in 2012, Dream Drop picked up the Straggler Hunchback of Notre Dame, definitely one of the less celebrated titles. And that leaves Pocahontas. Now, I was either not around or a little baby when most of these Renaissance movies came out, but I get the impression that Pocahontas was a lot more well-liked at the time and has dwindled in popularity, sort of like an inverse of Hunchback. This is the only movie in the animated canon that's based on any sort of real-life events or person with verifiable history to it, unlike the folklore-based Mulan or Robin Hood. And there's probably a reason for that. Real life is fucking boring, and so is Pocahontas. And I can't imagine it's a movie Disney is particularly proud of in 2022, nor do I think it's something Nomura really cares about either. I also can't imagine Sora getting involved with both sizing the issue of colonialism and genocide. Oh man, you made it political by saying genocide, Wah. The animation is nice at least, even though everyone's faces sort of creep me out. I just think if there was ever a time for this one, it was like Cage 2 or maybe one of the side games, but I think it's just another thing that missed the boat, which has now swiftly gone around the riverbend and out of sight. A 1 for want and a 2 for prediction, solely because it's in that renaissance block and we have precedence to consider. The audience was decently higher for both scores, giving Pocahontas a 4.59 want score for 18th overall and a 3.78 prediction score for 11th overall. I personally would consider a good chunk of the remaining CGI movies to be slightly more likely than Pocahontas at this point, but that's just me. Okay, maybe except for this CGI movie, 2000's Dinosaur. Between Disney and Pixar, there are two dinosaur movies, one called Dinosaur and one called The Good Dinosaur, but they're both bad dinosaurs, so go figure. This movie also marks the start of what you might consider a second dark or bronze era and a nearly untouched decade of films. In this era, only Lilo and Stitch has been given a full world in Kingdom Hearts, and most fans, including myself, would venture to say that the world isn't really that full. You could chalk this up to these next few movies all being in production or releasing right before our two first numbered titles that gave us a total of 15 Disney worlds, but i chalk it up to most of these movies being bad, or at best unpopular. None of the side games nor KH3 felt the need to pick them up despite having more than enough time to conceptualize or develop them, yet instead usually opted for returning worlds, much newer material, much older material, or just out-of-the-box stuff. Not out-of-the-box, which would be a great world. Maleficent and Pete would show up here and demand Tony and Vivian to release the contents of the box to them and confusion would ensue. You may have noticed from my not talking about Dinosaur that I have very little to say about Dinosaur. I watched it on a shitty projector screen at school in kindergarten, and even my child self, who had pushed in all of his chips in the holy name of dinosaurs, could not be Tyrannosaurus fucked to care about it. The Animal Kingdom ride at Disney World was sort of fun at least, and is pretty much the remaining vestige of Disney caring about it either, as far as I know. 
know, a 1 for prediction, but a 3 for want actually, solely because I want to see Dinosaura, because you know that they would say Dinosaura. The audience is less amused by this pun potential, giving Dinosaur a 2.7 want score at 30th place and a 1.5 prediction score for 29th place. Moving on to a much more beloved 2000 outing, it's the Emperor's New Groove. I kind of feel like this is just another wrong place, wrong time spot for New Groove. If it were the same movie but in CGI and released in like 2011 or 12, I bet we would have seen it in KH3. I'd also wager it would be the funniest KH world since I consider Emperor's New Groove to be the most consistently funny Disney movie. Even in spots where I might not find it particularly amusing, it's still trying to be funny very often. Part of me wonders if that also has anything to do with why we haven't seen it yet. I struggle to think of a cage world that's based on a property that's a non-stop comedy like New Groove. Maybe Monstropolis or a fairy tale kingdom. But even those, especially the latter, are a lot more low-key by comparison. I think it could be a writing challenge for sure, though I do think Cage 3 was the most conventionally and consistently amusing Cage title by far. I'd imagine a world like this, possibly titled Kingdom of the Sun, might drop Sora off with a recently llamified Cusco, whom the antagonists are after as one of the new Seven Hearts, obviously. Especially if Sora were to be alone for some or most of this outing, having him be a Pacha substitute could be fun and definitely a test in writing. And even though there are jungle-esque portions of this movie, and I said we've already covered that ground, I think this movie is a bit more set apart with its Incan influence and a few more recognizable set pieces than something like The Jungle Book. I still just don't feel that confident about it though, sadly, so I'll give it like a 2.5 prediction rating, but a 6.5 for want. I'm not ride or die for this movie, but I definitely would be happy to see it. The audience is overall more enthusiastic on both counts, giving it a want score of 7.96, easily the highest score so far, at third place. The audience also has a bit more faith in it as far as prediction goes, giving it a 4.48, which is 9th overall. Next up is 2001's Atlantis The Lost Empire. This is another movie that Disney doesn't really seem to acknowledge a ton, though the same can be said about a lot of these films from the aughts. This movie and the next one are both underperforming sci-fi flicks, and both have a bit of a cult following even despite their relative obscurity in Disney history. Depending on who you ask, one might say that Atlantis has been in Kingdom Hearts ever since KH1, because Kingdom Hearts fans famously cannot read, and I can say that because I am one. In all honesty, I kind of wonder if this movie is or has ever been held back by having a title slash major location with a name so similar to Atlantica. It would definitely be weird to have both in the same game, but maybe not so weird for it to show up after not having participated in Finny Fun for over 17 years. Sadly, I still don't see it as cool as the aesthetics are and as fun of an adventure as it could potentially be. Not that the majority of the movie takes place in expressly underwater environments, but I think there's a clear choice for a primarily water or ocean-based world and it's always going to get in before this. Even without that other contender, I still don't know if Atlantis ever really had any legs. Again, unless it's a pet movie of Nomura's, I don't know if I could recommend holding your breath for it. I have no doubts that it could work, I just think there's too much outside baggage working against it, and even though it has a dedicated and vocal following, I don't know if they're going to use Atlantis for one of the six or seven world slots in KH4. It would make those vocal fans happy for sure, but leave a large chunk of people asking what and why. And unlike KH1 with Nightmare Before Christmas and KH2 with Tron, KH3 didn't really have a screwball pick, unless you count Olympus showing up again, which is tempting. A prediction of 2 for me, but a want of 5.5. I'd be happy for its fans, but it would almost certainly come at the expense of the next film's inclusion. The audience definitely turned out for Atlantis though, giving it a want score of 7.92, just slightly below New Groove and in 4th place. They were also a lot more bullish on its chances, with a prediction score of 4.54, 8th overall. It was hard to talk about Atlantis without outright dropping the name of 2002's Treasure Planet, which has a lot of similar energy both in its vibe and its fanbase, though I think this film's following is a bit bigger and louder. Longtime viewers of the channel probably know that this is my dream pick for a Kingdom Hearts world and has been for a long time. It's not even like a personal top 5 Disney movie for me, I just think it's fucking cool. I don't think it's that deep, I don't think the characters are like super memorable or charming, the plot is a pleasant enough father-son story, but it's also Treasure Island in fucking steampunk space. I simply want to see it and play it in the KH way. I know a lot of people are down on it, as well as Star Wars to an extent because of how travel in KH is contextualized through space, and so a treasure planet world would necessitate moving about outer space within a larger outer space. My counterpoint there is that this has never really stopped the series before, considering weird space travel oddities like KH-1 Monstro, Neverland, and Birth by Sleep's Deep Space. 
It could also be something akin to the Caribbean, or even its Port Royal predecessor, with your initial arrival being based on like one planet or a ship, and then opening up to other areas through an open world or selectable areas from a map. Furthermore, KH4 might not even use space travel as contextualization for moving between worlds, especially if Sora is based in a realistic quadratum and will be returning there frequently. Like, I doubt gummy ships are a thing in unreality. All of this being said, I still think this world has next to no shot, unfortunately. While more critically praised than Atlantis, it was a bigger flop, and Disney also doesn't really care about it. The closest we came were some inklings of it being developed for Dream Drop Distance, which released the year of the film's 10th anniversary. Now we're 20 years out, and I think the moment has passed, unfortunately. Yes, this movie is 20 years old now, and that is in fact frightening. Joseph Gordon-Levitt voiced Jim, and he's 41 now. I will still be naively optimistic and give it a 3 for prediction rating, just because it seemed to have a shot at one point in time and is something of a fan favorite. It's a me favorite for sure, and it's getting a want of 10 for me. The audience also wants to make this a reality, giving Treasure Planet an 8.38 want score, making it the second most wanted movie on the survey. They're also slightly more naively optimistic, giving it a prediction score of 4.97, which is 6th overall. God, these next ones are going to be rough. Sorry for giving away so early that I do not care at all about 2003's Brother Bear, though I'm not sure how many people are going to be out there in the comments all ride or die for Bro Bear. I actually watched this movie a ton as a kid, usually on long car rides, and once again, I don't know why, I guess we just had the DVD. Brother Bear is another more personal story, sort of like Fox and the Hound, so it isn't immediately obvious to me how to make a good KH world out of it. I do think it's had a bit more staying power in both Disney's and the public's consciousness, and it did much better at the box office than the last two films we discussed. I don't know, I just find, like, rural North America to be boring. Can I say that? I live there, so the forest is boring, the mountains are boring, cowboys, the Wild West, it's all boring, I don't care about any of it, and Kingdom Hearts has never featured any environments like that, so I figure, why start now? Uh, Coda is also annoying, I'm sorry. Maybe there's like a really neat cage parallel that I could think up that would make a Brother Bear world make perfect sense, but I don't have it in me. A 1 for both scores for me. The audience gave it a want score of 4.59, 19th overall, and a prediction score of 2.66, 16th overall. 2004's Home on the Range gets a 1 for both want and prediction scores for me. The audience gave it a want score of 2.32, 32nd overall, and a prediction score of 1.39, 30th overall. We've arrived at the curious case of 2005's Chicken Little, a movie from the aughts besides Lilo and Stitch that actually does have a history with Kingdom Hearts. If you recall, Poultry Small appeared as the first summon in Cage 2 and is still unique in that he was featured in the Japanese release before his actual movie came out in Japan, so he effectively served as a promotion for the film. And that's all I think the series ever intended to do with him. The movie actually did do well at the box office, even though it doesn't seem to have a ton of genuine fans 17 years later. I know there are plenty of people who play Kingdom Hearts and grew up with these movies to the point where it would make sense for them to have nostalgia for them, but like, do they? I never really see anyone waxing poetic about Chicken Little or Home on the Range, and I think it's because they're just kind of bad. Chicken Little, to me, is the Disney movie that most feels like a bad DreamWorks movie. Its energy just feels really off and weird. It's just sort of ugly, both in visuals and in its spirit, if that makes sense. Unless I get to beat the shit out of Chicken Little's dad, I have no interest in seeing this adapted for Kingdom Hearts. I did own the Chicken Little video game on GameCube as a kid, and that was more than enough for me. I think Zach Braff can stay locked away in the baseball charm for now. And by now, I mean ever. That'll be three one scores in a row for me for both ratings. The audience also isn't falling over itself like the sky for Chicken Little. A want score of 3.53 for 26th place, and a prediction score of 2.51 for 19th place. Up next is 2007's Meet the Robinsons, which I definitely think is more fondly remembered and appreciated than the last two or three films. It's kind of a weird one, it sort of gives off like an XD so random holds up spork kind of vibe, which I find a little grating, but it's at least more visually interesting and entertaining than the last handful. Todayland, or even just the Robinsons' house, would make a more than usable cage environment, but again, it isn't so much an adventure and more so a personal story about a kid trying to find a family. It feels like the more action-packed movies of the 2000s just didn't perform well, and the more successful movies are a bit more contained and maybe less adaptable for the KH formula. Maybe this one would have been best suited for a game like Dream Drop, a spot for less beloved properties and also a good opportunity for some time travel synergy. On second thought, I think we've had enough of that. The movie is charming and clever enough though, and if we're just going off my feeling that these CGI movies are more likely, I wouldn't call this one completely dead in the water. It also doesn't feel entirely shunned, and people generally liked it. 
but again, if we're looking at a game coming out in optimistically two to three years with like six to seven spots for worlds, I think the newer catalog of unused movies are just more likely picks. I still wouldn't hate it though, and wouldn't say absolutely no chance. I also fucking love Young Goob. A want score of 5 and a prediction score of 3 for me, with the audience giving it a 5.59 for want, 13th overall, and a 2.98 for prediction, 14th overall. Next up is 2008's Bolt, the last movie about a dog that we have to talk about today. And I say have to instead of get to because boy do I have very little to say about Bolt. It's really weird because, let me just unbury the lead here, Bolt scored pretty poorly on both fronts with the audience. Despite being pretty well liked at the time and grossing well, it seems to have had very little cultural impact. It was just sort of a cute dog movie for that year, and that's it. I expected people to at least find it more likely than like Brother Bear or for God's sake Chicken Little, but it scored worse than both. Like, again, I know this movie left, like, no mark, it didn't exactly pee on the cultural fire hydrant zeitgeist, but below Black Cauldron? Below the Aristocats? I don't know, I'm not, like, a big Bolt guy either, but, you know, if it's a movie about discovering your own reality isn't all there is and breaking into something new, it doesn't sound like the worst or most impossible thing for a cage for. You know, like, it's from this century, it doesn't look awful, people at least liked it, despite literally nobody ever talking about it nowadays. And, like, we've already seen Cat Sora, but never Dog Sora, so maybe it has a shot. Don't get me wrong, I'm still giving it a prediction and want score of 2, which is lower than where the audience put it on both rankings, but I'm operating on my own scale here. For the record, you all gave it a want score of 4 flat, which is 21st place, and a prediction score of 2.4, which is 24th place. This next one is pretty interesting, it's 2009's The Princess and the Frog. I remember hearing a lot of chatter for this one, potentially making it into Cage 3, but obviously it didn't make the cut. Besides, once again, Lilo and Stitch, I feel like this is the only movie of this decade in this category to have any sort of prestige to it, if that makes sense. It's also the last time the main studio did a fully 2D movie besides that aforementioned Winnie the Pooh 2011, which obviously already has representation in KH. And I also think that out of every 2D movie left on the board, this one is the most likely to be seen as a KH4 world. Even though Disney sort of bowed out of hand-drawn animation for their movies after Princess didn't really crush it at the box office, they still seem to keep this movie in mind and use it here and there. They are, for example, going to be re-theming Splash Mountain to be based on Princess and the Frog, which, as far as rides based on film properties go, is potentially the biggest upgrade in theme park history. This is also the first movie we're talking about today that's set in America that I don't find to be super boring or unremarkable as far as environments go. Give me a New Orleans world over some nondescript nature setting or a New York every day of the week. I definitely envision it as another shrinking down world, probably turning Sora into a frog himself, and I think there's genuinely a lot of potential there. Plus, if they're going to keep up that new Seven Hearts thread, Tiana could be a good pick to fill in those ranks. They can definitely do it without her, since there's really only three spots left if you count Kairi, but she's a princess in the official lineup and on paper has a better claim than many others. But, you know, Cage gave Alice a spot over Ariel back in Cage 1, and nowadays they aren't even using the term princess to describe these new seven, so who knows. They all do happen to be princesses so far, but the jury is still out. I'm pulling a big coward move and giving it a right down the middle prediction score of 5. It all goes back to my gut feeling on Cage 4 leaning into 3D, Pixar, and live action stuff, but if they decide to have some new 2D things, I think this has to be number one on that list. And I'll give it a want score of 7.5, I'd really like to see what they do with it. The audience felt similarly, if a bit more confident, giving Princess and the Frog a want score of 7.65, 5th place overall, and a prediction score of 6.03, also 5th overall. Breezing past the first half of the 2010s, and yes, skipping Wreck-It Ralph due to its inclusion in Union Cross, and don't worry, we'll talk about that at a later date, we arrive at 2016's Zootopia. This one was definitely big when it came out, though I wouldn't say it's had that Frozen or Moana staying power, maybe not even something as persistent as Tangled, but bigger than, ironically, Big Hero 6, and I think if we shift KH3's development cycle and release date a year or two into the future, there's a good chance we could have seen Zootopia show up in it. I don't really have trouble envisioning a Zootopia world alongside what we got in that game, though I do have trouble envisioning what they'd make Sora look like for this outing if his Monstropolis design is anything to go by. Disney definitely hasn't forgotten this movie, it's gotten better retroactive treatment than pretty much everything from the aughts, but I feel like they've taken their foot off the gas a bit on Zootopia. Is it because they looked up what people were drawing and writing about it? It's because they had safe search turned off, isn't it? I would say those poor executives, except I would never ever say that. In terms of the environment and vibe, I could see it working really well, I just sort of wonder how they'd make it work thematically. I know they could, but I would honestly worry about them doing the movie justice in that regard. Zootopia is first and foremost about discarding harmful stereotypes. It's a movie Anthem the Wise could have used back in 2005 for sure. I would love to see the team attempt incorporating it into a cage 4 I'd just be sitting here like, 
please don't fuck it up, basically. I also wonder if its chances are damaged by it being a big city environment. Obviously its population and aesthetic are different from something like a San Francisco, but if we're going to have a main hub world in what I assume will be an open world quadratum, is Sora just going to go to another open world city in Zootopia for one of his journeys? I guess it doesn't necessarily have to be an open world thing like San Francisco. it could go for a more of an area based style. I don't know, I think you want to vary the types of environments as much as possible, and even though it's a big cartoony animal metropolis, it's still a metropolis, and I wonder if they'll be worried about big city fatigue. But in spite of all of that, I'll give it a prediction score of 6.5 and another want score of 7.5. The audience gave it a want score of 6.92, 7th overall, and matched my prediction score with a 6.5 for 4th most likely overall. Moving on to another 2016 film, we have a big one, Moana. I've stated on the record before that this is my chalk pick for most likely world in an upcoming KH game, and KH4 is no exception. This movie was massive, it was well liked, it is still well liked, and it's the biggest juggernaut Disney's had since Frozen, which always felt like a shoe in for Kingdom Hearts. So I have no real substantial reason to believe we won't be seeing Moana in KH4. I think it worked great visually, I think there's enough of a sense of adventure, and thematically I think it's a great fit. Really any Anything that references or has to do with people who have died or otherwise moved on from one world to another, I'm gonna be high on that. There's some Pixar stuff that leans into that a lot more, but Moana's strong connection with her late grandmother would be amazing to see explored under the KH4 context. And if we're looking for another new Seven Hearts candidate, Moana has to be the biggest lock for that imaginable. Because frankly, she's an icon. I am a grown man, and I want to grow up to be like Moana of Matanui. If there is any other movie or property that prominently features the ocean, you can throw it right the fuck out of consideration because there's no way it gets past Moana. On top of this, you have to imagine Nomura likes Moana if he likes Frozen. I just think it's so naturally good for the cage formula. Her and Maui as party members, a given, a Tamato and mini boss if they know what's good for them, a lock, bring back some of the sailing mechanics from Cage 3 Caribbean, obviously. Or I mean, maybe not, you could just make it like an area-based thing like Cage 2 Port Royal if they don't want to feel redundant or they feel like they're just doing Caribbean again but more cartoony. I'll take either. I'm giving Moana both a want and prediction score of 9 and the audience feels pretty much the same. It's the number one movie for both scoreboards with a want score of 8.41 and a prediction score of 8.38. Skipping past the Ralph and Frozen sequels, we arrive at 2021's Raya and the Last Dragon. I'm not gonna lie, I still haven't seen it, and if you really wanted me to, this video would come out even later. But from what I understand, this movie would fit pretty well in Kingdom Hearts, and Raya also seems like a natural fit for both a party member and potential new heart. I mean, she's literally described as a princess of heart, and somehow that information had not made it to me until writing this script. I mean, we're dealing with a movie that's really big on the concept of capital H Heart, so it almost feels like it's made for a cage world. I've been told the environments are interesting and could lend themselves to the kind of gameplay and exploration we saw in Cage 3, and just from my looking at promotional stuff and skimming around to get footage, I can't really disagree. I guess the only thing holding it back is that people seem to be kind of meh on it, and a lot of folks seem to think that it's just sort of boring or that its message is a bit off. Ultimately, I do think the environment is probably most important when it comes to making a fun KH world, and if the team is allowed the extent of freedom that they had with something like San Francisco or Toy Box in KH3, they can just sort of do what they want with the story or themes. If they're stuck with rigidly going by the movie plot like Frozen or Tangled, then they might run into some trouble, or at least it sounds like it. Again, sorry for not watching this hour and a half movie for this one paragraph, I guess I am not as committed to my craft as I thought. But from what I have observed and been told, I'll give Raya a prediction score of 6.5 and a want score of 5. I don't think it'd really be fair of me to give it anything higher or lower than that given the circumstances. Coincidentally, the audience also gave Raya a prediction score of 6.54, the third most likely movie overall. And for the first time, the audience prediction score is actually higher than the want score, which was 5.83, or 11th overall. And finally, we've arrived at our most recent film in the animated canon, 2021's Encanto. And don't worry, I have seen this one, and I liked it a lot. It's definitely had its moment in the sun, and I don't know if you can quite say that it's at that Frozen or Moana level, but hearing We Don't Talk About Bruno on a regular radio station has to mean that it's penetrated the larger cultural consciousness. It's a visually stunning movie, the cast of characters is great, but the environment is what I get sort of hung up on. This movie is, once again, much more interpersonal than stuff we usually see, and almost all of it takes place inside a house. A magical, sort of sentient house, sure, but a kind of cramped and contained house nonetheless. There's definitely a lot of reasonable creative liberties that can be taken here, like greatly expanding on how much space a given door might have behind it, which the film already sort of does. 
It could also venture out into the town setting a bit, which the film also does from time to time. I feel kind of similarly to Encanto as I do with Zootopia. Can KH do this movie justice, a movie that's primarily about, like, intergenerational trauma and family, something this series has never really touched before? Next to Floaty, family is like the big F-word in Kingdom Hearts. Parents are mythological. Could Sora even comprehend the concept of an uncle or a cousin? We gotta take baby steps here, you know? I know people might also leave to Mirabelle being one of the new hearts as well, but I'd actually be actively against that. I think it would kind of go against the point of the movie to give her some sort of special power or role given that she's the only one in her family without any kind of magic besides Abuela, who would be the boss, obviously. No heartless, no evil casita, just a 10 HP throwdown with grandma. Anyway, yeah, I'm feeling kind of iffy on Encanto, though I'd love to see them try their hand at it. Again, if they like set it after the movie or just go off the beaten path a bit, maybe there's a bit more synergy and exploration or combat potential, but I'm kind of hedging my bets. I'll give it a want score of 8, but a prediction score of 6. Once again, the audience had a higher prediction score than want score for this movie, giving it a prediction score of 7.28, the second most likely movie, but a want score of 6.92, the sixth most wanted movie. And folks, there you have it, so concludes the presentation of results from part 1 of our KH4 World Watch survey. There were a few surprises or head scratchers in the data, but by and large it's about what I expected. I anticipated the top 4 for predictions would be these 4 films in some order, but was surprised by how deep of a run films like Treasure Planet or Atlantis made it on the want scoreboard. As previously mentioned, the only two films to get a prediction score higher than their want score were Raya and Encanto, the two most recent releases. Also potentially of note, those top four movies on the prediction side also had the smallest difference between audience scores. Moana, for example, only had a .026 difference between its two scores. On the other end of the spectrum, Emperor's New Groove, Treasure Planet, and Atlantis all had the biggest gaps between what people want and find realistic. New Groove was at the very bottom, with a difference of 3.47 points. As I stated up top, most of my eggs are personally not in this category's basket. Besides Moana, I can't say I feel truly confident about anything we talked about here getting in, but I'd still love to see a lot of this stuff make it nonetheless. And if not for Cage 4, then for something else. Even if my prediction scores were super low for a lot of the material here, I still had fun trying to envision what each of these worlds might look like, and writing out my thoughts made me feel more confident in some of their chances when it was all said and done. But I've got my eyes set on some other candidates from categories that'll be covered in future surveys and videos, which again is where you come in. The survey for the Pixar films is still open, and you can find that in the description and pinned comment. Thanks so much for watching, if you enjoyed, consider leaving a like and subscribe if you want to know when those future episodes release. And if you really, really enjoyed it, please consider supporting me on Patreon, which is the best way to ensure that I can retain the privilege of making these kinds of projects. Thank you once again, stay safe out there, and I'll see you next time.